Ooh, got it. That's new. I'm gonna start letting these people in. Okay. So we're just going to actually wait a little bit, um, give everybody a chance to log on and be admitted into the Zoom. So in the meantime, please head to menti.com. Um, everything's on the screen here, and we're going to be having an interactive question before we get this awesome meeting started. Can I get a thumbs up from our panelists to see if uh, we're live on Facebook yet? <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I think as people are filtering in, um, Kim, do you want to move to the next slide so we can start seeing some answers? All right. Welcome, everybody. So before we get um, our meeting started, just go ahead and head to menti.com. This is going to be our first interactive portion of the evening, afternoon. And tell us where the source of your water is. <laughs> So go ahead and head to menti.com. We want to know where your water source is. We see the kitchen. Koke'e, wai ale ale, okia, honolulu pipes. Very specific. Is that Josh? <laughs> um, ahukua'a, koke'e, makaleha. I see makaleha in the chat. Awesome, awesome. Alright, we got the money for it. Awesome. Okay, tell us where the source of your water is. 
Um, go ahead and head to menti.com, everybody. See, we have about 21 people. I'm um, gonna leave this up here for one more minute and then we're gonna get started. <laughs> All right. Oh, we got a couple more. We got a couple more coming in. Ahuwa'a. Waiava Watershed. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you all for participating in our Mentimeter as we get started. Um, just to kick us off, I will be your host for tonight. So my name is Halen Chalk. I am the Kauai Invasive Species Committee Outreach Specialist. I wanted to aloha and welcome all of you tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm just gonna go through a few introductions and some housekeeping. So um, we tonight along hosting with me is going to be Kim Rogers of Kauai Invasive Species. She is our rod outreach specialist. We also have Julia Dagman of um, Kauai Forest Food Recovery Project. Hello everybody. Awesome. Um, so just a few housekeeping things I have to go over. Uh, if everybody can stay muted throughout our talk stories while our panelists are speaking. Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat, uh, either during somebody's talk and either Kim or Julia will be bringing those up at the end of their talks. And there also will be an open floor discussion at the end of this for everybody. Um, if you're joining us from Facebook, also, we will be looking at the comments, so feel free to drop any questions or comments you have um, in that comment section, and either Julia and Kim will bring those up for our speakers. All right, so to get started, thank you all again for coming, and we have a wonderful panel. So to introduce our panel, we have Helen Rain right over here with Hanalei in the background. She is a watershed plant, or um, a Hawaii conservation coordinator for um, Pacific Birds Habitat. We also have Yuki Reese of the Watershed um, Branch of the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And then we also have Makana Riley from Hawaii Land Trust. Um, and I'm very happy to have you all here. Thank you for joining us, ladies. Thanks, great to be here. Awesome. So just to get us started, as you know, our theme is Aya Ihea Kawaya Kane. This is cir uh, circling around watersheds and the health of our watersheds. And of course, I know some of you have heard the music in the background that was playing, and that was actually a modern take on a very ancient song called Hemele no Kane. So before we get into all of these awesome talks, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that song and connecting a cultural component to tonight's talk. So just give me a moment to share screen. Okay. And put that in present mode. Okay, can everybody see that? Everyone see okay? Awesome. Okay, so the song that was playing in the background was very intentional. It is a very ancient song. It's a mele. Um, it's called Hemele no Kane. Why is it not going? Okay, so who is Kane? That's the question here. Um, so Kane is actually one of four major gods in the Hawaiian pantheon. Um, four, the main four that I would like to highlight right now is Ku, who is the god of um, politics and war. Uh, we also have Kanaloa right here. He is the god of the ocean, all of the depths of the ocean. Um, we have Kane, who I'll get more into um, in the next slide. And then we also have Lono here on the end, and Lono is the god of peace and agriculture. Um, so just a disclaimer, you know, I um, am Native Hawaiian, I have danced hula my entire life, and a lot of the mythology that I'm sharing with you is something that I 
currently study. I've studied my whole life and I really love it. And I'm very happy to share it with you all. Um, and by all means, this is a very amazing song that I'm about to share with you. And the depths of this song can go much deeper. So on your own time, if you feel like going into this melee more, into mythology more, I highly recommend it. Also, if you're interested in the art, this is art done by a local artist named Solomon Enos based on Oahu. So Kane, Kane is the god of fresh water, of life. Um, he is brothers with Kanaloa and he has a lot of stories of him all around Hawaii. Um, it's really beautiful to go into all of these stories and to share and connect that scientifically to our natural phenomenon. So we're gonna look at kino lao or forms of kane. So kino lao is a body form, kino, body. So kino lao of Hawaiian deities often represent elements of their stories, adventures, and natural phenomenon they represent. So in this slide here, I have um, some coral or ko'a, which is one of the first things, first forms of life under the ocean. We have kalo, we have ko, which is um, sugarcane. And we also have ohe. Um, and as you know, if you have grown any of these, you know that they're all water intensive plants. So just to draw that connection back to water. We also have rain and clouds as a body form of kane. Um, and then this one particularly is the sun. So even though it's not the physical form of water, the sun is also a form of kane and the name of that is kane hoalani. So going into this mele, um, if you wanted to look at the lyrics as well, um, Kim and Julia will be dropping links for those accesses for the entire song with the translations as well. So Hemele no Kane, in every verse, there is a stanza that says, He ui, he ni nao, a query, a question. He ui aku ana au ya oi, I put to you. Aya ihea kavaya Kane, where are the waters of Kane? And that is a continuous theme through this song, constantly looking for these waters of Kane. So the first verse is Aya ikahikina kala, puka ihae hae, aya ilaila kavaya Kane. I wanted to highlight this because, as I said previously, a body form of Kane is the sun. And this first verse talks about the sun rising at the eastern gate where it comes at Hae Hae. There is the water of Kane. So Hae Hae, that in my research, I found that it is heaven's eastern gate or the portal or the far east horizon when the sun rises out of the ocean. And it's also a physical place. So Hae Hae is actually a place right here on the tip, the far eastern tip of Hawaii Island next to Kumukahi. And I think it's just really amazing how those, the same name can mean a multitude of things. So at the far eastern end of our archipelago is where our Kupuna was like, okay, that is where the waters of Kane are in the far east. And then it travels all the way to the far west. So in the next line, it goes, Aya i kalana kala, i kapayo pua i kekai, ea maiana manihoa makamole mai o lehua. So if anyone from Kauai has seen lehua or nihoa, you know that is part of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. You can see it from the west side. And I think it's just amazing to see that our kupuna knew a place on the far eastern end of the archipelago, all the way in Hawaii Island, travels all the way around to Kauai, to the far western end. And that was like a key component of the hydrological cycle was the sun. Um, Kalana Kala, this is a word I wanted to share with you all. Um, it is a name for a natural phenomenon that it, it's, it's like when the sun, it's this exact kind of picture. I'm not sure if this is what our kupuna exactly meant, but it's where it's super clear and it's like the sun is floating. So our kupuna is very ma'a to personifying natural phenomenon and especially with water. Our next verse is Aya ike kuahidi ike kualono ike avava ike kahavai aya ilaila kavaya kane. And this would be yonder on mountain peaks, on ridges steep, on valleys deep where the rivers sweep, there is the waters of Kane. And this is more of our physical, tangible places of water in our watersheds. Up in Waialeale where 
Yuki's background is. Um, down in Hanalei, where Yuki is, and all of our backgrounds. These are our tangible places of water. Um, the next verse is Aya Ikai, Ikamoana, Ike Kualao, Ike Anue Nue, Ika Punohu, Ika Uakoko, Ika Aleva Leva, Aya Ilaila Kavayakane. Yonder at sea on the ocean, in the driving rain, in the heavenly bow, in the piled up mist wraith, in the blood red rainfall, in the ghost pale cloud form, there is the water of Kane. And Uakoko, the blood red rainfall, is actually um, mentioning another natural phenomenon, which is a very low hanging rainbow where you only see the red. So that's another beautiful phenomenon I wanted to share down, coming from the mountains to the ocean. And then Aya Ibuna Kavaya Kane, Ike Ao Uli, Ike Ao Ele Ele, Ike Ao Pano Pano, Ike Ao Popo Lohua. So this is going to be all of the water that's above us in our heavens. Um, the part of the <clears throat> watershed that's our clouds and our rain, everything that gets caught in our forests. Um, up high is the water of Kane in the heavenly blue, in the black piled cloud, in the dark black cloud, in the black molted sacred clouds of Kane, of the gods. There's the water of Kane. And then lastly, Aya Ilalo, Ikahonua, Ikavaihu, Ikavaiko, Akane Nekanaloa, Hevai Puna, Hevai Inu, Hevai Mana, Hevai Eola, Eola, Eola no Ea. Um, and just to connect it back down, it, it, this beautiful song goes from the very top, the sun goes down to our watershed through our tangible rivers and streams down to the ocean from the sky all the way to our groundwaters beneath us. So deep in the ground in the gushing spring in the ducks of Kane and Kanaloa, a wellspring of water, a water to quaff and a water of magic, the water of life, life long may it live. So I just wanted to share this with you that this is a beautiful melee talking about our water, our ecosystems, and just to highlight how this ancient knowledge is still applied to all of the science that we look at now and how we look at managing our resources. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to leave those in the chat and I'll love to get to those later, but I don't wanna take away any time from our, our guest speakers. And if you wanna check out uh, the modern version of this, there is a reggae version on Spotify called Himele no Kane by Kaikena Scanlan. So thank you. All right, so thank you for bearing with me for that. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand this off to our first speaker, which is going to be uh, Yuki Reese. So take it away. Yuki is, um, she works as a watershed planner for the Kauai branch of Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Um, Let's see, she works on landscape level restoration projects on Kauai with an emphasis on holistic watershed scale approach. Um, Yuki works with a collaborative restoration project underway at Honopu Valley, which she'll be sharing with us. And um, take it away. Thank you for being with us. Oh, I think you're on mute. Thank you for that. Okay, sharing the screen. Can you guys see the sheet, the screen share? Okay. We can see it, but it's not in um, presentation mode yet. There we go, perfect. All right, great. All right, well, aloha everyone. And thank you, Halen, for that introduction. And thank you for having me here. Um, I was just saying, as we were getting ready for this, that, that this, the, the act of speaking into my video at home is such a different experience than getting to be in a room with everyone, which I'm looking forward to doing not soon. But um, for now, I'm grateful for this chance to be able to talk. And as Halen said, my name is Yuki Rice. I work with Kauai DOFA um, through the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit of the University of Hawaii. And my talk today is really pretty simple. Um, was thinking about how to talk about watersheds. And really, this is just going to be 
thinking about what a watershed is, what is a healthy watershed, and then using the example of how DOFA is protecting watersheds through uh, one particular project. So again, watershed, ahupua'a, I was thinking about this, putting this talk together, you know, watershed is really that universal term for that water cycle, you know, that was present in that song that, we're, that we all learn about. And the ahupua'a is a much more specific Hawaiian way to put more cultural context into that, describing a similar phenomena. So here's kind of a sketch of just that watershed showing the different parts of it. So um, as the water starts in the mountains, in the Mauka areas, that water is gathered by the forest, the rain, the snow, the fog, and then moving down through um, in streams and tributaries, coming all the way down, flowing back to the ocean where that water is then raised up into clouds and brought back up into the mountains, filling that cycle. And as that water moves through the whole watershed, it percolates, it infiltrates, it creates groundwater uh, and fills those aquifers. So the entire valley there is really the watershed. A lot of times people tend to think of just the flowing water on the surface, but really starting to broaden that, that um, the thought of where a watershed is into that, that full, the full aspect of it. Um, and again, just putting this on here, thinking about, we traditionally see that ahupua'a kind of represented often as a wedge of, of land. So just overlaying that to the more uh, sketched out version. So what makes a healthy watershed? Um, healthy watershed starts with a native forest. And again, as you picture that, that photo on the right, Ohia leaves capturing that mist, capturing the rain, the water running down the barks of those trees, infiltrating into the ground, percolating down in. A healthy forest has diversity, it's complex, and it has those openings that allow that water to come down in and be captured in those aquifers in that ground. And then as it moves through, that rain returns to the ocean through that flow. So the streams, the tributaries, the waterfalls that we see. Another aspect of a healthy watershed is that it is full of, of native aquatic species. So such as oopu, opai. And these species are able to actually climb waterfalls, uh, move, go hundreds of, of meters up waterfalls and infiltrate that whole system. Then moving downstream again to spawn, going out to the ocean, coming back in again as, as in the adult form. And so again, that part of that cycle, part of that watershed is those aquatic native species. But when that cycle is interrupted, so those are the aspects of a healthy watershed, but then the signs that, that of, of watersheds that are becoming degraded or less healthy is as invasive species become dominant. So that photo of the guava, guava forms thick stands, which unlike a, a native forest, the water, the water can't percolate into the ground through those masses of roots that form. That water runs off, it erodes the soil, and it doesn't recharge the groundwater the way that a native forest does. Um, another way that that cycle is interrupted is through diversions. So, you know, as the water is diverted for other uses, for human use, for hydro, for agriculture, that water may not return into that same stream or into that same system. So again, disrupting that flow. And the other thing that happens as uh, that cycle is disrupted is in aquatic invasive, invasive species come. So for instance, the smallmouth bass, and again, unlike the native species where each animal has its niche, an aquatic a nit, uh, invasive species comes in and then becomes dominant the same way that guava is and starts to override and, and really push out those native species. So one project that I just wanted to highlight today is the Horopu Ecosystem Restoration Project. And I kind of subtitled this, How to Protect a Watershed. Because again, I think a lot of times when people hear the word watershed, they think just of the flowing water part without really thinking about that larger context of how protecting our native forests really is protecting the water that we have. So this project is happening up in um, Koke'e, up in the, the Mauka areas. And the, it involves a, in that area in red, it's a 264 acre, so a landscape scale, large scale um, ungulate proof fence. So that fence is being built now, and then ungulates will be removed from that, both with the help of hunters and with the help of the state. 
And by protecting that native forest, by removing those ungulates, what we're able to do is allow that native forest to continue. So as ungulates come in, they trample the, the young plants as they come in, they disrupt, they tear up that forest. Um, and by allowing that area to be free of those, it enables their, that, that first step, that important first step, that native forest to be intact in that watershed. Um, another thing that that fence does is I'm sure you've all heard of rapid ohia death or rod and know that it's here on Kauai now and it's starting to move up into these more pristine areas. And there's a lot of data now showing that within ungulate free areas, there is much less prevalence of rod. And so again, this is just another step in protecting that watershed and to keep those native forests continuing. Another aspect of this project, which again is part of protecting that watershed is the removal of invasive weed species and the replanting of native species. And, you know, as most of you know, if you've done any hiking up in Koke, there's a lot of different species up there that are non-native. And so in a restoration project, we focus on the habitat modifiers. So the ones that are gonna really come in and make a difference in terms of the uh, integrity of that forest. So for instance, strawberry guava, as we talked about, you don't ever find just one, right? You're gonna find hundreds of them forming a thick mat. The Australian tree fern, similarly, they start marching up that watershed, filling those ridges, and as well as Kahili ginger. And again, most of us have probably had the experience of hiking. You're going through some beautiful native forest, you come into a patch of ginger and it becomes a monocrop where all you see is, is ginger. Another important aspect of protecting that watershed is just understanding and documenting the diversity of what's there. So a lot of this Honopu project is being driven by the seabirds that are nesting up in that area. Um, we have the A'o or the Nuo Shearwater and the Wa'u or the Hawaiian petrels that are nesting there. And part of this project is also within that larger ungulate fence is a smaller social attraction pro um, project, which is a, a smaller predator proof fence that will be attracting those seabirds into but we're also going to be doing surveys to better understand the youth, how the Hawaiian hoary bats are using this habitat and how invertebrates. And this photo is actually of a, a land snail on Oahu, but wanting to use that as a symbol for these invertebrate surveys that we're gonna be doing to understand what we do have in Honopu. Because a lot of times, you know, in these systems, we really don't know, or we don't have a current understanding of that. Another important aspect of protecting a watershed is predator control. So as we talked about, this, this fence will eventually be ungulate free, but even within that system, still doing predator control for rats, for cats. Um, within that system already, we have these, these uh, rat traps. These are a self-setting rat trap called a good nature trap. And these predators affect not only the animals that are in there through you know, ground nesting, seabirds are very vulnerable to predators, Forest birds are vulnerable to predators, a lot of the inv native invertebrates as well. But this also helps protect the actual forest and the plants that are there because these rats are eating the seeds, they're eating the small saplings, and as well as all the damage that the ungulates can do. So ongoing predator control is an important part of protecting a watershed. And one of the final aspects of this is just public education, you know, putting signs at trailheads so people understand um, about rod, making sure they're cleaning their boots. And we're also working on getting, putting together um, interpretive signs so that people can better understand what they're looking at. I feel like you often have a knee jerk reaction. Well, there's this fence, it's taking something away, but I think it's important to also educate people about all that that fence and that ability, the restoration projects are giving in terms of the integrity of the watershed. So not just protecting the forest right where it is, but protecting all of the water as it goes downstream, flows into the ocean and, um, and perpetuates the cycle. Um, and for those of you that haven't visited, this is uh, a Kauai specific website that DOFA has developed. It's kauaiforestusers.com. I'll, I'll put that in the chat as well. And this is sort of your place for all things, all projects that are going on. So if you wanna learn more about this project or other things that are happening on state lands, um, this is the place to go. And we are actually in the middle of a big overhaul. All of the uh, uh, DOFA websites are being updated and improved. So stay tuned for exciting things to come from there. And with that, I will take any questions. We're doing questions now. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a couple awesome. questions and then um, 
let's see. I'm going to go ahead and see if there's any questions. And if there aren't any, then we can always take questions at the end as well. Um, Julia or Kim, do you see any on Facebook? I do not see any on Facebook. I do not. I do not have any either on Facebook at this point in time. And I'm checking a couple of different sites. No, we're good there. OK, so I guess one question that we have for you is, how do we find balance between traditional hunting practices and protecting our watersheds? Thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, I, I think that that both are important. And um, I think one of the things that that uh, DOFA uses to be able to prioritize where where different forest uses are most appropriate is um, is making sure that we spend the time and the funding to invest in protecting the places where we have the most pristine and native watersheds um, and forests. And so again, as you know, there's a lot of places where there's there's no longer a lot of native forests left. And so being able to protect those places where we do still have that is just a high priority and also allows for that balance where there that can then be um, hunting and, and other forest uses can be encouraged um, in places where there is less pristine forest left. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us and um, for answering that question for us. Yeah. I have a quick question, Haylin. Yeah. Um, Yuki, what is the status of the fencing project up there? Is it underway, you know, or is it, when is it projected to get started or projected to be completed? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a great question too. So the fencing is currently underway. I think it's about uh, halfway done and expected to be completed by the end of this year. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you again, Yuki. Um, thank you. If anybody has questions, we will also circle back at the end. So remember, if you don't have a question now or if you're a little Gila Gila to drop that in the chat, then you can always save that for the end. Okay. Um, so with that, we're going to slide into our next talk. Um, I'm going to be introducing Helen Rain of Hawaii Conservation. Um, she's a Hawaii Conservation Coordinator for Pacific Birds Habitat. So Helen, thank you for joining us. Um, Helen, let's see, works with a the Pacific Birds Habitat Joint Venture. Um, she will share about how wetlands and bogs and other characteristics of Hawaii's forest ecosystems help reduce flooding, improve water quality, and improve habitat for endangered koloa maoli, uh, the endemic Hawaiian duck. They're so cute. I love them. Um, and with that, take it away. We're so happy to have you, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. That's a great introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about how unexpectedly wetlands might help to keep us dry. And this first screen is actually, um, it's a graphical representation of a project that they're thinking about in Thailand called a sponge city. So we can be thinking about sponge cities as I go through that. And at the bottom right there, there's an, a park also in uh, Thailand, which they use to actually absorb flood water. So wetlands are pretty powerful things. Um, and as Helen said, I work for Pacific Birds. Um, it's a joint venture. There are joint ventures across the whole of the United States. Um, but Pacific Birds works on the West Coast and then the Hawaiian Islands. And just to kind of put us in context, these are some of the partnerships that we've been building in Hawaii. That's how the joint venture works. We build partnerships to try and protect wetlands and get wetland work done, at least here in Hawaii. So my PowerPoint is a little slow. It seems to be a bit glitchy on the screen. So while it's thinking about it, um, oh, there we go. Wetlands can help to keep us dry because they're able to soak up some of the problems from the uplands. So if we get very intense rain up in the uplands, if we've got the kind of habitat loss that Yuki was describing, if we've got invasive species, I could only find a Christmas tree here, but imagine it's a guava instead. What you end up with is problems in the lowland because it rains like heck, the water floods down there, and, you know, we living in Kauai, we all know the kind of problems that brings. That's homes, schools, bridges, infrastructure damaged and flooded, um, sediment and mud all over the place. 
And eventually, if those sediments and pollutants rush out to sea, they damage our reef. So that's how wetlands can help uh, to kind of bridge that gap while we're trying to restore the upland forest and protect our fantastic native habitat, wetlands can be there to catch some of the, the problems on the way down. So Yuki shared that great slide of, of how a watershed works. And within that watershed, this is how a wetland works. So imagine a load of fantastic ohia lehua up here on the left-hand side in the forest at the top. It's catching the water, but if it's damaged, if there's too many guava trees, if it's full of invasives, uh, the water starts speeding down the hill. The stream energy has not been dissipated, but if you have a nice wetland in the way between that watershed area and your town, then you kind of get a second chance. It dissipates the flow, it helps the water get back into the water table, the contaminants sink to the bottom and they get filtered out by the wetland plants. You get cleaner water on the way out. And as a massive bonus, at least for somebody who works with Pacific birds, you get bird habitat. And so Hanalei um, has been looking, the Hanalei Watershed Hui got a big grant uh, recently to try and understand how to use wetlands and other nature-based options to kind of give us those ecosystem services and to, to, help, to help slow down that water. Um, so they're gonna be looking at options like connecting the river back to the floodplain, and that can go a long way back into the um, Ahupua'a and up into the forest. Um, it might include planting native vegetation because that withstands Hawaii's climate so much better than an Albizia tree, which just kind of goes, oh, I'm going to fall over, ends up going down the river and out to sea. We were going to also think about purchasing or leasing land to make a big flood control area, aka a wetland. You know, if it's allowed to flood when it rains, then um, basically it's a wetland, even if you call it a flood attenuation pond. And also thinking about wetland scapes, so really trying to extend how big we think about these things. Instead of a small wetland, let's think about multiple wetlands or a big wetland or all of the above. And basically it's cheaper, it works better, it is much more pretty than a nasty great big concrete uh, wall that is going to canalize a river. And the bottom line is, as we saw in somewhere like New Orleans, your grey infrastructure, levees and bulkheads, they work for a while, but when they fail, they fail catastrophically and you really end up with the mother of all floods. So we don't want that, especially not in Kauai. So really the idea is to try and go back to this Hawaiian principle of the land being the chief and man being its servant. The Hawaiians managed their land through Ahupua as they knew that everything was interconnected, everything from the native forest at the top all the way down to where they grew their food, um, the taro and still do today. Um, so we wanna kind of get back to that idea. And the, the reality is it's cheaper. If you start talking about infrastructure costs, it's very expensive, but a wetland can save you billions of dollars a year in flood control and is much cheaper to create. Um, and the Environmental Protection Air Agency uh, did a summary report looking at 17 green infrastructure studies, and they were all cheaper, ranging from 15% to 80% cheaper. So that's definitely the way forward. And taro is part of that picture. It, you know, taro grows in wetland areas, and it can also help absorb some of that flood water. My computer's just thinking about it. So these are some of our native Hawaiian birds that rely on wetlands. And I would love to talk about all of them, but I do not have enough time. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the Kaloa Maoli because they really connect, as do the Nene, but perhaps more so the Kaloa Maoli. They connect the upland forest area with the lowland wetlands because they use both of those habitats. And they're pretty rare. There's only estimated to be about a thousand individuals. Almost all of them are on Kauai. We are the Noah's Ark for water birds because on the other islands, they've interbred with um, feral mallards, basically barnyard ducks. Um, and so we are the place that really needs to look after Kaloa Maoli. 
and the habitats where they live can help look after us. So just to kind of illustrate this, when my computer wakes up, uh, what you're gonna see next is a, an image of the Alakai Swamp. So you think about wetlands being in the lowlands or coastal, but actually the Alakai Swamp is this huge uh, wetland right up on the top and it acts like a giant sponge. It holds all that water in when there's a big rainfall event and without it, we would have much more serious flooding. And this is just uh, Quiferous bird data taken more or less over the last 10 years showing Koloa duck sightings and a couple of their nests, those are the stars. So these birds commute between Hanalei, that's their stronghold, but they're also all over the rest of the island, up to the Alakai swamp to feed, sometimes to nest. They might molt up there, during which time they can't fly, so they're pretty vulnerable. So it's, it's important for us to look after the Alakai swamp so that we don't get flooded out and so that the Koloa have got somewhere, somewhere to live. And Nene are often frequently found up there too. So that was it for me. It's kind of a whistle-stop tour of how wetlands and forests connect. But if you want to find out more about our work in Hawaii, uh, look us up at pacificbirds.org. All right, awesome. Thank you, Helen. That was very informative. And you know, when I was um, listening to this talk about wetlands, I couldn't help but think about when I went to college in Oahu and now in like the Mapunapuna area, whenever it's the rainy season and it's it's a normal flooding season for all of us, it, it's like every year it progressively goes deeper and deeper underwater. Because yeah. from if I'm correct, I mean, the whole Waipahu, Waikiki, all of these places with names with Y in it used to be wetlands, but now it's covered in concrete. And now with King Tides and Akaka'ako, all of these urban areas are going to be underwater. And like, I'm not sure if there's any data that will show the impacts that you know, urban Honolulu has had on our native birds on Oahu at least. And I'm very fascinated to look deeper into that, but that was just something I was thinking of during your talk. Yeah, actually the University of Hawaii have been doing some great research looking at what is gonna to happen to wetlands over time and what area might be available for taro in the future, because some of it will be new areas and what areas will be lost. Um, so yeah, they've got some pretty fascinating stuff going on. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, any questions from Facebook, um, Julia, Kim? Any questions here? Let's see. Um, no questions on Facebook for me, and a couple of comments just in the chat, um, but nothing real specific for Helen. Um, okay. Um, well, let's see. I have some questions here. So, let's see. How's about, what is the most important conservation measure to keep our wetlands healthy and connected to our forest? Yeah, I think that goes back to Yuki's talk, the work that um, DOFOR is doing in Honopu and other partners we are doing across those highlands are so important for the health of wetlands. And conversely, wetlands can help when they're failing. So I think we need to take an ahupua'a approach. We need to take a leaf out of the Hawaiian's book and look at how we manage those whole areas um, because it's, it's definitely more effective if you can get some of the problems in the forest under control and angle fencing is definitely part of that then your wetlands will do better too mm -hmm. and it's going to change as climate change intensifies there will be potentially more wetland areas but they might be in different places and some of the traditional areas might be flooded with seawater so i think we're going to have to adapt as we go along mm -hmm. I think that's what I really love about science and being indigenous and just always having a fascination in science is, is uh, the future is in the past. And I think the more research that gets done, we all really realize that that's where we need to go. I mean, our places were managed very well prior to you know urbanization and the modern times we live in now. But um, thank you again, Helen, for that wonderful talk. Um, we also have some links being dropped in the chat right now for everybody. So if you'd like to save those, go right ahead. And if you have any questions that come up later, again, we'll be taking questions at the end. Okay. Let's see. So moving into our next talk, I will be introducing um, Makana Riley of Hawaii Land Trust. Um, 
Thank you, Makana, for being here and for joining me today. A little bit about Makana. Um, she is a mother of two, and she is the director of Aina Connection at Hawaii Land Trust. She was born and raised in Manoa Valley on the island of Oahu and currently resides on Kauai, um, where she leads up the work to enhance community connections to the Hilt's public lands through, throughout Hawaii. Um, and Makana will be sharing a little bit about Kahili and the work that they do here on Kauai and the restoration projects that are going on right now, um, more towards our Mulivai areas. So thank you, welcome. Aloha, thank you so much, Haven. Um, you can see the Muliwai at Kahili behind me. I'm not actually at Kahili. I'm in an office, <laughs> I know. Um, do you wanna go ahead and start out with the video? Um, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of just like a teaser about the protection of Kahili itself. Uh, and then I can kind of go into what's happening uh, currently at Kahili in terms of our stewardship. Okay, awesome. So I will go ahead and share screen and get that going. And just a heads up everybody, if you could, I guess all of us as well, turn off our video so that the connection might help the video run better. Um, and then we can turn it all back on when the video is done. Also, if you have a connection problem or it's a weak connection, we'll also be dropping the link to the video so you can watch it um, separately or on a different device. So I will go ahead and play that now. Most people don't realize the history of the area. They don't realize what it took to, to get what they have today. They don't realize how it was used in the past, how and why the land was divided the way it was, why one ahupua straddles another, why it crosses over the river, why it takes off Mokulea Point. They don't know those things. And it is my hope that the more people know about this, about the past, the more they will take ownership of its preservation. Kahili was a place of royalty, its name, um, Kahili. It was a place of families that fished and farmed Kalo and Kuleana up the river valley. It's a, it's a place that reminds us of the power of wind and waves. And it's a family place. So the families in Kilauea come all the way from plantation days um, and much, much before to gather, um, to spend time together. And my dad sustained us from there. Whether he was diving or throwing net, Kahili was always a place where our family got food. We grew up going over there and um, was really close to home. We always used to go down there and go surfing. And this was a really safe beach to go to. It's still a special place and it's still really beautiful. It makes me feel comfortable. It's actually really nice, right? <laughs> it makes me feel like kind of calm and like comfortable. I've been coming here probably since I was a baby, I think. When the plantation closed in 1970, we were told that we'd have access to the beach areas. Landowners came and they bought property. Fences went up, no trespassing. We started to realize that if we didn't do something about it, our cherished place would be gone. It's incredibly important for the community to have places that are safe and clean and free to go to with their families, to play and to relax and just to enjoy this place. To preserve whatever you can and we have whatever we have now. I just get great joy in the fact that people can use it. We can still capture the essence of Hawaii.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope that played well for everybody on that end. And I will hand the floor over to Makana. Thanks, Halen. Um, so that video was actually um, created about two years ago. And it's, it's interesting to even for myself to watch it to see how much has changed in just the last two years um, in terms of the work that we're doing on site at Kahili. So uh, the land trust has protected that Kahili beach preserve area for many years. Uh, most recently in the last couple of years, we've hired part-time stewards um, to who are from the community. We have on, Connie now and Uncle Tim. Uncle Tim was in that video also. Uh, and they're all from the Kilauea Kahili community. And also some of them are lineal descendants of the area. And as part-time stewards with Hilt, they're running, you know, educational programming, like after school programs and working with the schools in the area for field trips, but you know, in the last year and a half, it's virtual field trips. Um, and community work days, we have monthly community work days. And then Uncle Tim was very much our, uh, he was like our security guard, like our bulldog, you know, um, very much that sort of intimidating presence to try to uh, prevent any of the, and mitigate any of the funny business that's happening uh, on site and it really has helped uh, Uncle Tim for for about a year he was walking the beach every morning uh, and you know picking up any of the marine debris that he saw but just just having a presence there on site makes such a huge difference um, so that people really see that the community really cares about that place uh, and has a sense of koleana to it and you know, has those conversations with the surfers that come and, you know, even the tourists that come to enjoy Kahili Beach. Um, and we definitely, Hilt, even though we only, you know, own uh, about 17 acres down there at the Muliwai um, here behind me, the dunes um, at the Muliwai, we also work very closely with our neighboring landowners. Um, there's fish and wildlife on the northern side over here. Uh, and then we have private landowners across the Kahawai from us and next door to us. And we try to work as much as possible with our neighboring landowners uh, around you know, responsible stewardship and at least on our property restoration. Uh, we have quite a few ironwood trees. Um, and though they are invasive, it's, you know, we're sort of in an interesting position where the ironwoods are preventing any type of weeds from growing underneath on the dunes. So that's sort of a good thing. It's it's kind of allowing us where we have been planting naupaka, uh, clearing some of the dunes of whatever has been uh, invasives that have been growing and just sort of allowing the seed bank to um, pop through and see what, see what comes out. Uh, and, and then also the ironwoods also provide a nesting habitat for the eva. Uh, if you've ever been down to Kahili, there I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen so many Eva. And um, so, you know, if it, if it were a long-term process of trying to get rid of the ironwoods, it, it, would, it would have to be a slow process of removing a couple and then trying to get some native, you know, nesting type trees to come through and then slowly get that to, to progress. Uh, we haven't started that yet. Um, we've been working much more on the um, undergrowth areas. And, uh, you know, the, like this area kind of that's shown here where the, the dunes kind of turn into the Muliwai and shoreline area. 
to see, you know, like the pohuehue and the pohinahina just kind of popping back up from the seed bank. Uh, we're also working in the Kahavai um, as it runs behind the dunes and up towards Kilauea Falls. Uh, that the, the river is actually protected by Hilt. It's not owned by Hilt, but it's protected by Hilt. And so we also work with neighboring landowners on doing salvinia removal. Uh, and that's been something that's been going on for many years. Uh, and, and it kind of, it does this roller coaster thing where it kind of blooms and gets out of control. And if there's no active, you know, stewardship happening, then uh, it, it can create a problem, especially when there are these uh, large rain events and it can clog up the river. And then also it just kind of ends up being pushed out, uh, which is not good either. And so we've been a lot more active in the last few years. Uh, the Warrens are one of our neighboring landowners and they're really passionate about the Salvinia removal. And so, you know, they are kind enough to offer their boat for us to use for some of our community work days or just small groups to go up and try to remove some of the salvinia. Luckily in the last couple of years, it hasn't gotten to the point where it's out of control and completely covering the, the kahavai. Um, and I think that that's just um, an, a testament to the ongoing management of the community, not just Hilt, but, but the community as a whole understanding you know the significance of managing that that area um i feel like i've gone over time already sorry Halen. <laughs> um no not at all um thank you so much for sharing that with us um and also all the work that you do to preserve places like this so that it's accessible for families and for um lineal descendants of kilauea and you know, the North Shore of Kauai, that we still have access to these places, which is so important, um, especially for myself, you know, to be connected to Aina and to have this place still be a place where we can go and to connect to. Um, so any questions? Do we have any questions from Facebook or from the chat? Anybody? I have a question, Halen. This is Kim. Um, I listening to Makana share all that she did, I was in seeing the video, right, with young people and families and everybody involved. I couldn't help but wonder if there are, and you sort of mentioned like community work days, you know, are there ways for volunteers to get involved? I would like to ask that of you as maybe as well at some point of all the panelists, you know, how can people, people want to give back, people want to help, you know, are there ways to do that down there um, at Kahili, Makana? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Thanks for bringing that up. We have regular community work days the first Sunday of each month. Uh, they start at 830 in the morning. Uh, and it really ranges in terms of the, the hana that's happening uh, on the, the community work day. But, you know, we, we've been doing like um, painting of signs you saw in the video that we had a we went to Kilauea Elementary actually and did a bunch of sign painting. And then just in the last couple months, we did another fun day down at Kohili where the kids were painting signs. Just really like um, putting putting it out there on site for people to see. I think I we tend to think that hand painted signs, uh, kid, kid lettering um, gets through to people, uh, touches people um, more than, you know, these super official looking signs. Uh, and so we, we tend to do a lot of those hand painted signs and, and then, you know, we we're always doing invasive removal on our community work days and, um, replanting sometimes if we have things to plant and then, um, definitely in the rainier seasons, Makahiki season, we're always working on mitigating some of the runoff that happens from neighboring properties that, you know, we don't own, but we're, we try to work with them on, you know, the runoff that's happening that comes down the road and then it, it ends up down on the beach, unfortunately. And so really trying to work as much as we can um, to mitigate some of that. Um, so uh, on our website, hilt.org, 
Uh, you can view the volunteer work days and sign a waiver and sign up um, or just join us for Sunday of the month uh, at Kohili, 8.30 in the morning. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it's really great to just spend time in the place and to give back to a place that's very special to all of us. Um, so we have a couple questions. So how has the work that you do with Hilt brought you closer to this Bahi? Um, I know that you were born and raised in Manoa and then moving to Kauai. So how has your work with Hilt brought you closer to this place and this Aina? And how have you seen the community relationship changed since Hilt's stewardship of this Bahi? Yeah, and that's like, that's totally what I was thinking about as I was watching the video. Things have changed um, and improved so much just in the last couple of years. Um, when we when we made that video, I had I had really just started with Hilt. Um, my family is all from South and West Kauai, and so I was never familiar with the East and North portions of Kauai. And when I started working with Hilt, we didn't have any stewards uh, hired for Kahili specifically. And so, at the time, I was living on Oahu, and I would fly over to Kauai to. Uh, run these community work days. We started up the community work days just to try to get get the community uh, on site and like kind of doing stuff. And then, um, you know, in about eight months time, we we got the funding to be able to to bring on a couple of stewards, part time stewards. And it was really important to us to bring on um, Kamaaina people that are actually from the community. Um, which was really important also to me in, in the eight months where I was, you know, caring for those um, community work days. I was very intentional about never being the representative for Kahili, but only being the representative for Hilt because I'm not from that area at all. My lineage is from the South um, and the West. And so I always wanted to... Um, be clear that I wasn't speaking for Kahili. And it's it's amazing in the last year and a half now having actual lineal descendants of the area caring for the place and running community programs and community work days and really pulling the community in, their community, uh, and that they can, they can actually be the voice of Kahili. Um, they have those generational stories about Kahili and you know, now at this point, being able to see um, from a sort of from a distance now, because I don't have to run those work days and I just support the team that we have on site there. It's, it's been really rewarding for me just to see how the communities come together and that they have taken ownership of their kuleana to Kahili. Mm -hmm. Mahalo, mahalo for sharing that. I know um, in my time growing up, uh, Kahili, otherwise known as Rock Quarry, has been a place of poor families, but also there have, you know, the occasional parties and, you know, we try to pick up trash as much as possible to Malama places like this that are Eva nesting places. Um, they have a lot like the Pohuehue and the Pohinahina, um, Pauohi'iaka, all of those wonderful native plants. So, um, like if we want to go and call you, if we see any kind of um, tomfoolery, I guess, <laughs> to protect the place, who would somebody call? Would we call Hawaii Land Trust? Yeah, totally. You can definitely just call us. Um, my number, you can call me <laughs> um, and I can definitely get the information to our stewards. We've, we've got a good like community uh, group text happening where if there's any kind of stuff happening, they text our stewards and someone's on it. We're working really closely with KPD um, and DLNR. Uh, there, there are still full moon parties that we're trying to sort of deter. Um, and really the only way that we can deter it is by being present. And so we, we just try to be there as much as possible. And um, we try to just display what we feel is responsible um, stewardship and presence in place uh, in the hopes that, that others see that modeling and, you know, think about it at least. Yes, awesome, mahalo, mahalo. 
Um, so I know we are coming up on five, uh, 5 p.m. So as we come to a close, I would like to do a round robin question for all of our panelists. Um, and then we're gonna finish with a Mentimeter uh, interactive with our guests tonight. And then we will punny and we can be done for the night. So for our round robin question, everybody, I'll start with uh, Yuki and then we'll go in that same pattern of how do we protect our waterways for our children's future? in your opinion. I was thinking about that, like listening to Makana talking. And I, I would say the thing that pops into my mind is, is speaking for the forest. Like when conversations come up and you have an opportunity to tell people about the importance of native forests, the importance of protecting native species, um, the importance of cleaning your boots or, you know, just all of the things that we know to do and just take that little bit of extra effort to do or sometimes having that conversation that you know again like it seems like oh I'm sure everybody knows about you know why native forests are important or why it's important to protect watersheds but but just educating yourself and and taking the time to have have conversations and make that be a part of the community dialogue. Thank you. Uh, so the question for Helen. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. Um, I think we're going to have to innovate. Things are going to change dramatically, and um, the water cycle is going to behave in a different way as we go into climate change. And I think one of the things we can do is look back to where um, we know there was traditional wetlands in the past. Um, Hawaiian chants talk about them. There are legends about them. So look back to the past and then try and project to the future. Where are we gonna see wetlands coming up and how can we kind of work to protect those areas before they even happen as we basically retreat from sea level rise and, and some of those problems. So yeah, we're gonna to have to duck and dive a little bit and, and think big. Great, great. Yes, thank you, Helen. Um, going back to Aya Ihea Kabaya Kane, it's gonna be everywhere with climate change coming soon. <laughs> Um, and then same question for Makana. Yeah, I think sort of tagging on to what Helen, Helen's perspective, you know, um, with, with my young kids, uh, I think it's, it's presence, it's ongoing constant presence. And like what Yuki was saying also, just constantly having that conversation and that ongoing narrative around our responsibility to our places. And then, you know, uh, one of the things with my kids, they're obsessed with knowing what we're doing, like, what are we going to do? Well, what are we going to do now? And, you know, if we have plans to go to the beach, it's like, oh, are we going to surf or are we going to do this? And it's like, well, we brought all of our things, but we're going to get there and we're going to kilo our space. And then we're going to allow the place to decide what we're going to do. And I think that, you know, empowering the next generation with that tool to constantly kilo observe and make the decisions on a regular basis it allows them to be informed every time they go back um, that they build that foundation of knowledge about their places and then while also recognizing that every single time they go back the place decides what they're going to do and you know the the storm decides what we're going to do um, and the way that we're going to take care of our places. And so I think, you know, it's, it's presence and it's kilo. Thank you, mahalo, mahalo for that. And I, I totally agree with um, that model of letting the place tell us what we're going to do, um, especially in places like Polihale. Um, Sometimes I have the full intention of going to the beach and enjoying my day, but there's piles of trash or something that needs to be picked up or something that needs to be gathered. And I'm like, well, it's a good thing I brought trash bags. So that's what we're doing today. <laughs> um, and you know, whoever comes with me, congratulations, that's what we're doing. <laughs> um, taking care of our places and being present in our places um, and being aware and like kiloing uh, the changes that are happening in our wetlands and all around us for every rainy season. Kauai knows this better than ever with the constant flooding that we are starting to see as a regular thing. Um, so now that we are done with our presentations, we're just going to finish with a quick interactive Mentimeter. 
So we're gonna have that up. Kim will be sharing it. And um, if before you go, just go ahead and share with us on menti.com, where are the waters of Kane that impact your life? For me, I live in Wailua, Wailua Nui Aho Ano. So um, example number one would be when it was flooding last year, all the albizias came down and I was like, well, I guess I'm stuck on this side of the bridge. <laughs> so that is it for me. Um, so right before we go, we'll just get some answers going. Go on to menti.com and copy and paste the code in there and tell us where are the waters of Kane that impact your life. This could even be, you know, um, Mana Plains. Beautiful. And in case anyone didn't know, Mana actually used to be a wetland. I just learned that recently. Kahili, Hanapepe, Alaka'i, your kitchen, Oke'e. Awesome. Hanale. All right. Got Pu'ukukui, I love Pu'ukukui. Wailuku, Iao. Who's calling in from Maui? <laughs> Great, these are all awesome answers, everybody. Oh, we're getting some more. Kealia, Kanaha. Beautiful, beautiful. I love seeing where everybody knows where their waters are. Pakala. Keep switching. I'm trying to find a new one. <laughs> Anahola. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us tonight, everybody, all of our guests. Um, I just wanted to mahalo all of you. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Um, our contact information should be up. Um, also, you can message Kauai Invasive Species Committee on Facebook for any further information or links, um, or Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project as well. We have a mailing list here in the chat, so we're going to leave that up for anybody to copy and paste all of our social medias. Um, yeah. Maybe let's invite everybody to unmute themselves and just give everybody a big round of applause and thank yeah. you. To okay. let everybody know, our panelists know, there are people out here listening and we appreciate it. So. I'm not just talking into the void. <laughs> yes. Mahalo. All right. Um, mahalo again for joining us, everybody.